Good afternoon. I'm Alan Wolf. And Hi, and I'm Jan Cheatham. Uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, we're going to be talking about the process that we went through in, in establishing an electronic lab notebook service for campus. We're relatively early adopters in the I, of a service at an enterprise level for electronic lab notebooks, although certainly there are, are small installations on probably many of your campuses, some of which you may know about, some of which you don't. We'll talk a little bit about that as part of our strategy. Um, the other thing we wanted to start doing as a community uh, is start a community conversation about tools like electronic lab notebooks and other tools that will support the ongoing management of the scholarly record uh, as scientists, social scientists, and humanists start working more in a digital environment. We think it's going to be very important what we're finding with our graduate students um, across disciplines is that many of them want to work in a digitally born environment and from there uh, they get they get uh, frustrated by the fact that they're expected to work in paper because that's the requirement that their lab has so we're trying to head off some of the people going off in their own directions so I'll begin uh, by talking about what electronic lab notebooks are. Um, of course, they have a lot in common with paper laboratory notebooks, which are a centuries old tradition for recording the, the discovery process along with the data. But there are a few key differences. Um, one of them is, of course, electronic lab notebooks are software, uh, so they're not generally a device at all, they, although they can be used on many different kinds of devices. They're collaborative, um, which is, I think, a big change from paper notebooks because it can, it can be really hard to keep track of what someone is recording. If you're the, the principal investigator, uh, you may not get to see the lab notebooks of, of the people in your group uh, very often at all. Um, and so electronic lab notebooks have a lot in common with some of the file sharing platforms and the collaborative tools that we use every day like Google Docs and, and Box and Dropbox and so forth. Um, but like the traditional paper lab notebooks, um, electronic lab notebooks are a place to record the thinking process. Um, the observations, the data, the conditions under which the data were collected, the conclusions, etc. cetera. Um, they also can be used as tools for compliance. Um, right now, the main standard that most electronic lab notebook manufacturers are, are sort of pitching towards is the 21 CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, um, which I think speaks to the comparability of electronic records, um, having them count in the same way for legal purposes as paper records. Um, there may be other compliance kinds of standards coming in the electronic lab notebook uh, market. But lab notebooks in general are considered a tool for protecting IP, um, intellectual property. Um, and many, many patent defenses have involved producing laboratory notebook records. Just a very quick history of the idea of and uh, implementation of electronic lab notebooks. So it, it kind of looks like back in the 1980s, a few people started thinking about them. It looked like uh, that it's, it was chemists who were thinking about them quite a bit. Um, sort of seeing them as a tool for, <clears throat> excuse me, a tool for uh, pulling together some of the chemical structure databases that were in use. Um, also thinking about the automation of labs. A lot of people envisioning the lab of the future would be one where instruments would be hooked up to software and people would be recording um, their their observations in, in the same record. And of course, that, that is happening more and more, not so much, I think, on, on higher education campuses and in higher education labs, but I think even in, we're increasingly seeing more sophisticated software um, and people are collecting some of the output of instruments in, in tools like MATLAB and, and so forth. Um, it it kind of looked like some folks at uh, a chemist at Virginia Tech and a, 
uh, a chemist at Procter and Gamble were sort of the original um, visionaries there. Then um, in the next decade, um, there there were more and more people using them. Um, so it looked like. Uh, in 1993, there was a full day devoted to discussion of electronic lab notebooks at the National Meeting of the American Chemical Society. Um, a, a group, uh, the Collaborative Electronic Notebook Systems Association spun up in about 1997. They started looking at architectures for uh, sharing information across lab notebooks. Um, the 2000s uh, saw a lot of people creating open source la electronic lab notebooks, so using some of the existing platforms. Um, in the top, you see an example of the um, Pacific Northwest National Lab notebook. Uh, looks like that was based on Java. Um, that, I think, had some uptake for a while, but it looked like it was discontinued, so you, you can no longer get support for it. You may be able to get it still. Um, another one was My Lab Book, which came out of University of Houston, Drupal-based. Um, you can still find it on their lab site, but it doesn't look like they're providing much support. So a lot of these open source things sort of came and went. There are still a few things, though, like the uh, Open Wetware has a tool that you can still use, a wiki-based tool, and more recently, Lab Trove, if you've heard of that one, um, which is based on uh, blogging software, also uh, available. Um, but at the time when people in the um, academic, academic section session uh, were working on open source tools. There was a lot of uptake in the private sector of commercial tools. Um, so that by 2012, um, a survey that was done of companies, uh, of researchers and companies, showed that about 40 percent of the respondents to that survey um, were using electronic lab notebooks in, at their company and. Uh, almost that many, again, were said their company was looking into it at the time they took the survey. Um, even so, there was a lot of consolidation and change in the ELN market at the time, a lot of companies buying out other companies and mergers. Um, and about that time, uh, a little bit later on, some universities started to sign site licenses. Um, so I think some of the earliest ones were Caltech and Cornell, Yale, and um, more recently, I think Ohio State has at least. They're almost. They're almost at the point of signing a site license. And of course, University of Wisconsin signed a site license back in July of this past summer. Okay, so about the time that we started thinking about electronic lab notebooks on our campus, which was about four years ago, we had been talking to a number of researchers and hearing from them about how difficult it was to keep records that were sort of half paper, half digital. So data is digital and the, the traditional notebook is paper. And they were, they were losing things um, when you can't keep the data alongside the documentation of the data, things get lost. People were losing the data themselves or they were losing the documentation. People were using things like Evernote or OneNote to keep their the um, expository part of their uh, record, uh, to, to keep that part of it, um, but they were losing the data. Um, we were also hearing that some people were starting to adopt electronic lab notebooks on campus, and there was some concern that we would end up with five or more different systems on campus that wouldn't be operable, um, that people were exposing themselves to some risk by signing agreements individually with companies, um, and agreements that didn't protect their IP or the data itself. Um, so there was some concern there. And our patent office was kind of a big driver in this process. So they've always been the authority on campus for good notebook practice. And of course, that involves keeping a, a complete and continuous record of the research process, one where there aren't gaps. So if, if, you, uh, if you made a change or you, you didn't record anything in your notebook, you usually made a note of that in the notebook. So it was pretty clear when something was missing. 
Um, notebooks also were a place to keep track of who did, who did what when, um, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of people even sign and witness <coughs> notebooks too. Um, so the idea, so provenance is, is a really important thing. Um, even though the patent laws changed recently, um, there are still good reasons, our patent office said, for keeping a good lab notebook. Um, there could be disputes that arise. You might need to demonstrate that you were using a process before a patent was filed for, um, um, among other reasons. Um, and uh, keeping a good lab notebook is a pretty good way to protect yourself against any accusations of research misconduct. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the research that you see, a, a lot of the re, uh, retractions um, often go back to people not being able to show that they had kept a complete archive of the data um, and so forth. Um, around, around four years ago, our campus uh, established a data uh, stewardship policy, which I'll describe in a little more detail. Um, and of course, funders were coming up with data stewardship requirements. Um, and of course, we're all thinking about the, the long-term the, the, uh, long archiving of research records. And PIs themselves and, and researchers themselves really wanted to have a single digital record that was searchable. That was kind of their bottom line. So all of these things kind of added up to our business case for pursuing electronic lab notebooks, which we kind of embarked on um, a few, about four years ago. And I mentioned our campus data policy. It, it has a few key provisions. It's kind of a basic policy. Um, in these four areas, um, one of the main things it, it says is that the PI is the steward for the research. The PI is responsible for setting up a way of organizing the data and um, providing access to the appropriate individuals and explaining um, their access to them. Um, the data should be retained for a minimum of seven years, um, sometimes longer. Um, and there's, there are rules about being able to take data with you when you leave. If you're, if you're, the, uh, if you're a graduate student who's leaving, you may, with the PI's per permission, take a copy of the data, but the original must stay with the PI on campus. If you're a leaving PI, then if agreements are signed with the new institution the PI goes to, then often the PI takes the data with them. And so the reason I brought that out is there were some implications uh, for the electronic lab notebook implementation that we did on campus. Um, we very much wanted to, to have this be a system that would align with that policy. And that kind of put some constraints on us. The, the software, we like the software, it's great. It's not quite where we want it to be with administrative functionality. And um, we, so we have had to um, kind of work with uh, adopters of the system to ensure that the, the PI is really in the stewardship role. And that's meant making sure the PI is the only one with the role of notebook owner. Um, owner is um, basically the, the highest end level of rights in the software. Um, the PI then determines the roles for the other individuals that are um, in their lab or in their uh, collaboration group um, and provides access to them through those roles and sets edit view rights, et cetera. The PI also has the ability to determine who can export and share from the system. And if they want to implement some kind of signing and witnessing, witnessing isn't, doesn't really work in the software very well. There are kind of some workarounds to make it happen. Um, the PI can also set up templates um, and processes for data management. Um, the seven year retention is something um, that exports can make possible out of the ELN system, but that's actually one of the main things that we want to talk about today is the thinking about the archival from the system and how it, it's kind of a work in process, as um, Alan alluded to. Um, we'll talk, he'll talk a little bit more about transfer, I think I, I mentioned also, uh, when people leave. So, of course, every, uh, one of the other elements that has been driving our adoption of tools like electronic lab notebooks 
are some of the funder requirements. And obviously that's very important to us at an institution that a big chunk of our annual budget is based on our research dollars. So the requirements that you keep an accurate record of your research are not new. Uh, all of the funders have said that, but they're becoming increasingly um, proactive in trying to manage what you choose to do, how you manage that record. So uh, while they're still trying to allow the disciplines to define what that means, the introduction of data management plans, first by NIH and then by NSF and then basically everybody else, uh, has really started some new conversations on our campus and many campuses across the country. And then the, the, the next wave of this with the open access, public access policy by our funders is another thing that's driving what kinds of tools can we provide that will help support our researchers. So we start, uh, one of the first questions we received once some of our new associate deans had heard about the public access policy was, well, will the ELN help us meet the public access policy? And the answer is yes. For many, of the for many of the policies, it's going to help us maintain more accurate research records. Uh, and the tools do allow for public sharing. Now, one of the things that we have done because of a limitation in the current product that we're working with is we've turned public sharing off because it's a, it's a binary switch. We can turn on public access for everybody in the, on campus or have it off for everybody on campus. And that's a problem in that our intellectual property people are very concerned about premature sharing of research data by someone accidentally clicking a button. The other thing that this is really going to help with and has, uh, and not that this is our most important driver that, that our administrators are happy about, but our administrators are happy about the increased auditability of, of having things in an electronic lab notebook. Things are time stamped so it makes it easier to find out who has access to the data, who had access to the data, and when it was accessed. So um, for the human, uh, for the intellectual property, um, our human subjects people are very excited because it means that they, um, they're hoping that they can, that human subjects researchers will be able to can store the entire human subjects protocol record, including the um, consent forms and other things in there in part because we're moving to a system in which they're going, to be audit, they're going to be auditing researchers to make sure they're in compliance with human subjects policies. So having a way that they can do it without interrupting the researchers is something they're, um, they're, they're hoping to do. And lastly, for export control. Um, they're interested in being able to monitor who had access to the data and have very fine-grained controls over who had access. But um, just as a, this is a very small snapshot, but the, we've got examples of the product that we're using, Lab Archives, as a public sharing platform. So we hope to work with the vendor to make it possible that the PI will have very fine-grained control to say what can be publicly shared and what isn't, so that accidents don't happen and pre we don't have premature release of the data. So. Uh, a little bit about the, the elements of compliance that we've been able to address so far. So far we haven't, uh, we're working on having this uh, available for protection of HIPAA data and our HIPAA compliance officer is, is looking at it actively. They, the company we're working with is a cloud-based vendor but they have signed the, the appropriate paperwork and we're now working it through our legal channels. Our human subjects um, officers will allow people to use the electronic lab notebook now with, uh, with the appropriate description in their IRB protocol, similarly with um, other health sciences, um, human subjects data. And the, the one group that we haven't worked with so far are select agents. So if you're not, select agents are um, things like highly contagious fluen influenza virus, um, um, there are computer codes that aren't allowed for export. Those things are something that we don't know that we'll ever allow in the cloud, but something we've negotiated with this particular vendor is the ability to host this on our own campus and put it within our select agent infrastructure. So that for those people who really need, uh, who want to use electronic lab notebooks but can't uh, use a cloud-based version, we'll be able to run it locally. So 
one of the things that we said we wanted to do was find out from you what's going on and start a community conversation about electronic lab notebooks. So um, maybe by show of hands, does anyone, is anyone else looking at, elect or does anyone else have electronic lab notebooks on their campus that they know and help support? What? Kentucky? Caltech. Caltech. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, we know. Uh, we, we work with, uh, with your people on the, the Net Plus service. Oh, so, so the other uh, lab archive adopters. Anyone else working with it? I think the optimal word for me is and support. Like, I know there are lab no electronic lab notebooks being used on campus, but mm -hmm. the library certainly isn't providing support for those. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, one of the reasons we uh, moved a little more quickly than we might have in terms of waiting for the product to be right was because so many of these, especially the cloud-based vendors, are offering a free individual um, license. So anyone can go sign up for an account and start putting data in. And that made um, our, many of our PIs nervous. It made our institutional research policy people concerned. Um, and that we wanted to head that off by providing an alternative to them. Um, how many of your campuses have data stewardship policies like ours? Um, or, or maybe you don't know. Uh, that was something that we had done. At, at, it was a campus committee of our faculty, our research faculty, who, who established this. And it basically was to, to set the, the, the chain of responsibility for managing research data in, in a code that the university supported. It doesn't necessarily mean that our researchers fully understand what that means, and one of the things we're trying to do is develop tools that align with the, our research policy so that we can, it, it's a way of guiding people towards a better practice of managing their data. Um, so how many other, has anyone else heard on their campus about people using electronic lab notebooks? Yeah, um, and so it, it, certainly one of the things you'll find too, so I would look in your chemistry departments, chemists have been way out ahead in the use of electronic lab notebooks, so that's a place to look for both expertise and for people using it if you're, if you're interested in uh, finding out who might be using it. But the, I think one of the, the things that you may want to think about taking back to your institution is a question about um, having graduate students going out and putting their data into these systems without the appropriate agreements and without the PI being able to get at that data. That is probably the biggest concern and, and one of the reasons why we'll talk about the implementation that we used on our campus to, to make it harder for them to do that. Um, So one of the things that we began with was a set of pilots. And actually, I think pilots have gone on at a number of institutions. Um, there's sort of a cautious approach, I think, to testing out a tool. Um, and I think prior to these pilots, what I had heard when I spoke with other people was that um, even some places where they offered electronic lab notebooks, for example, I think the chemistry library at Stanford um, pretty early on had a license for a Cambridge soft product um, and invited their researchers to come and use it and they got very little uptake and I think the the main story was that if it you know if it isn't broken don't fix it most people were pretty conservative about changing to an electronic system since paper was working pretty well so we weren't quite sure if we would have a lot of interest on our campus, but we started talking to people. We put out a call for participants uh, for a pilot. We got a lot of responses. I think we got about 100 or more people who were interested, and we ended up running a pilot with about 65 individuals. Uh, we asked them to use one of either of these two products, uh, ECAT or SURF, um, as the primary means for recording their research for three months. 
Um, but we also caution them to keep a backup copy of it on paper, either printing it out from the electronic lab notebook or keeping an analog lab notebook at the same time. Um, and uh, they were from pretty, pretty broad spectrum of disciplines. Um, and so the, what we found from that pilot was, um, first of all, people hated one of the products. Um, <laughs> But we can, we can say that now, that product is now defunct. So the, the SURF product, um, not because of our pilot, but um, other reasons, probably just the churn in the market related uh, kinds of reasons. Um, they did like the product called ECAT, though, quite a bit. Um, the, the main conclusion was that almost everyone who participated in the pilot, even if they used the SURF product, said that they would like to continue using an electronic lab notebook. So that was pretty good reason for us to go forward with a, a procurement process. Um, we, we went through a fairly lengthy one. They take a long time at a, at a state university. Um, and uh, at the end of that, then we signed a site license with lab archives. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about our RFP, our request for proposals. Um, it had uh, a lot of requirements for functionality. Um, of course, user interface is very important with a software tool that researchers are going to use as part of their research workflow. Um, we, we also looked a lot into things like identity management, security, compliance, data retention, disaster recovery. So we, we had a, a good group of people looking over the, pro the products uh, that we got responses from and, and vetting many of these things. Um, and uh, then, oh, that's right, we wanted to share with you um, at the bottom there, if you'd be interested in looking at our lengthy set of requirements and questions for vendors, if uh, the URL for that is there. Um, a, very shortly after we signed a site license, um, Internet2 became interested in doing a service validation. Actually, Cornell was the sponsoring institution. Um, and uh, they, we did, a, a along with Cornell and, and Caltech, and uh, Ohio State, uh, we did a service validation uh, for a Net Plus service. And again, that involved looking at many of the same things that we had looked at in our RFP. So functionality, uh, we had a multi-institutional security assessment, uh, legal assessment, came up with pricing, um, and uh, also out of that spun up an advisory board. Uh, so we're working with the vendor on their roadmap. So NetPlus uh, now has a service offering for lab archives uh, that's been around actually, I guess, since October. Um, and just a, a few notes about our service implementation. So this is a product that is designed to fit with SAML2, uh, the SAML2 identity management, the Shibboleth uh, integration. But because of our La, our uh, campus data stewardship policy, which says that the PI needs to be the steward and provide access to um, individuals uh, according to what, what permissions they want to give them, um, we wanted to take it another step further. So we wanted to be able to uh, have the PI decide who has access. And so that led us to an, a sort of a specialized integration using a, a tool uh, called Grouper that inter interfaces with SAML2, so that that kind of gave us an additional um, step of having to authorize individuals. I know at Cornell and I think at Caltech, um, pretty much anyone who can log in through your campus identity management can use the tool, but we've sort of put uh, a bit of a um, firewall around it for that. Um, and I'll explain a little bit sort of what's, what that's meant for us. Um, we also spun up a service team with uh, representatives from various units across campus, uh, libraries, the patent office, the office of the CIO, and, and IT staff in schools and colleges. We, we have our help desk providing very basic support and um, a few knowledge-based documents. So, so one of the things of putting this extra firewall, firewall around uh, the system has sort of necessitated um, is that we 
um, spend some time kind of in high touch situations, meeting with lab groups and helping them decide the roles and rights for individuals and also uh, setting up accounts for individuals. So we, we've kind of referred to this as lab onboarding. So labs, labs adopt the system uh, rather than individuals. And um, this is meant for us that we, we've been going to lab meetings and meeting with entire lab groups. Um, which actually has been great. So it gives us an opportunity to talk about the campus data policies, talk about data security, um, help them decide if they have the kind of data that's appropriate to use in, in the system, um, help explain what the roles and rights are in the system, how to set up and organize notebooks, um, how to set up rights for sharing and printing and exporting, um, and then this great it's just this great opportunity to talk about data management that we don't often get with researchers on campus. Um, and people ask questions that really relate to data management, and so we can talk about things like file naming and, and keeping track of different versions and um, linking, linking out to large files that are too big to be incorporated in the system. Um, we can explain to them how nothing gets deleted from an electronic lab notebook. That's one of, you know, one of the key provisions of, of a tool like this, and get them thinking about their backup and migration strategy out of the tool. So it, there are a, a number of export opportunities and, and kind of helping them think about which are the appropriate ones. So obviously, uh, since these lab meetings, we, we usually schedule them for an hour, and sometimes we've stayed for a couple of hours. Um, this is not all that scalable, um, as you might imagine. So we're thinking a lot about how we can scale that up. Um, one idea, um, and we've done this a little bit, is to meet with departments. So I know we did this, I think, in our dermatology department, which is a smaller department, have a number of PIs and, and lab groups um, kind of get onboarded at the same time. We've also been working with librarians and IT staff uh, in units on campus. We've had a number of train the trainer events. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of a learning curve for learning the software, and so anyone who wants to be giving advice on how to use it to lab groups really kind of needs to know how to use the tool themselves. Um, and, and so there's probably some coordination that, that we will need to set up as, as we scale things up a bit more. Um, the vendor has been great about providing lots of training and are willing to set up all kinds of customized training. They'll train individual lab groups. So that's been really helpful. And we've also found that usually in, in most labs, you'll get someone who's kind of the early adopter, who gets all fired up about using the software, learns all the, you know, the nuances of it, and makes it happen for the other members in the lab. And that's been really good. And we've also had some situations where kind of word of mouth has spread through different departments, some early adopters who let everyone in the department know that this great system was available. and, and why they were using it and um, suggesting that the others sign up. So just very briefly, we, so we launched this at the end of September. Um, we had a, a major communication out on campus about it. Um, in the first few weeks of adoption, you know, it looked like we were sort of headed for sort of a logarithmic um, uh, curve. Um, but then things kind of slowed down, the holidays came, and we we sort of put some of our communications on hold. Uh, we're, we're kind of looking at the ongoing funding for this. That's, that's kind of a big challenge. Um, and so we slowed down on our communications and the adoption has sort of slowed down a bit. But we're pretty sure that once we start communicating again that, that we'll see an uptick in that again. So, once you get labs into a system, one of the things that they always ask about, or as, as they become interested in, uh, a, in a system like this, the first thing that comes up is, how do I get out? Um, at least it should be, and it should be something that you talk about with your people as you do this. So some of the places for thinking about what we are doing um, includes how do you archive things? Would, even if someone wants to maintain a, their lifelong record in a system, most systems can't handle that very well. 
So thinking about how you have a strategy for archiving at least pieces of the lab notebook, either for checkpointing a project. So one of the things that um, some people have talked about in terms of a, a data management plan is in their, period, in their annual reports being able to share results out. So the idea that you could export data as an archive at, at annual periods, at the ends of projects. Of course, when PIs retire, that's when we, want, we don't want to just have their materials um, sort of disappear. We want to have an active project for a process from, for bringing their, their research scholarly record into our archives. When individuals leave labs, whether it's um, a graduate student or a postdoc with the appropriate permission of their researcher, being able to take a copy of the research that they, they did while they're there is um, very often something that they want to do. And our people move around a lot, so being able to export a, re a copy of the record so that they can take it with them um, is also very important. And the nice thing about something like an electronic lab notebook is it makes it relatively straightforward because the campus can maintain a copy as it's required to do as the owner of the research data, but transfer it also to the new institution. So then you actually have multiple copies. So in looking at what, what we're looking for in archives um, is both human and, and machine readable formats. Um, so that we can maintain that continuity of the record. So it's someone can go in and look at it, but also as technology becomes better and we can start reprocessing data, looking for new things, being able to, to um, get access to it. What we have now is less than perfect. Uh, right now there are two major formats that we can export, um, easily export from. We can export PDF versions of the pages. That includes most of the information, but not all. Um, or static HTML representations. So that includes a pretty complete act, um, element of the record. It also has some gaps, and those are things that we're working on the vendor with. The nice thing is they do, the company Lab Archives has a publicly available XML schema for their database, and that's where we're hoping to do more work with them um, to customize the exports that we need to make. What we're really looking for is that machine and human readable form that, in, that includes the complete set of provenance. So as someone makes changes, that's important records. In a, lab, in a paper lab notebook, when you make a change in your paper lab notebook, you line it out in a way that it's still readable and you make your change. Um, lab notebooks are, are great because you can make those changes and look at a history of those changes, but the archive has to reflect that. The other thing that we're in the archiving, as Jan mentioned, the ELN, our ELN was not designed for large files. So if you're dealing with files that are, a t um, each person has an individual quota of 100 gigabytes. For some people, that's a lifetime's worth of data. For some people, that's a day um, or less. So the ability to safely link to other, to large data sets is going to be really important. And it's something the vendor hasn't quite worked out yet, and it's something that we want to drive them towards as a community. But then also, how do you keep that record active? And how do you make sure that the, the file that was in, a lar in, in your archive, your large file archive, is the same one that, you're, that you was recorded in the ELN is going to be important. So how can you check, link, uh, check some that file? So again, managing large, um, large files. Um, the other element of this product, even though we're, our primary interest is as a tool for research support, there's a classroom edition. So, um, and that's more actively, well, it's actually very actively used on our campus. We're just, it's not something that's part of our group. Um, but certainly Cornell is using it quite actively as a, in the classroom version. But that raises a whole nother set of archiving and export needs in terms of students being able to export their data and have long-term access to the data they, they created as students. Um, and to maintain that record as part of a, a, the classroom record is another important thing that we need to work with the vendor on. The other thing that we want to do is really work with the vendor on integration with other data management tools. I'm envisioning lab notebooks as just one of a, a collection of tools that will help our researchers with management, including integration with instrumentation, data processing, and um, analysis tools so that we can set up data workflows. 
A big thing that um, vendors have not addressed yet is migration. So when we want to move on from lab, ar lab archives to the next best thing, how do we get our data out and into a format that's usable? And um, let's say everyone says, these ELN, we're just not ready, we need to wait another five years, how do we get our researchers out? Or a researcher decides they don't want to be there anymore, what do we do for them? Um, migration, um, it, it's very much reminiscent of the learning management system issue that, well, it's not completely solved yet, but is part of the solution, or, or is better, if in a better place than ELNs, is how do you move from one LMS to another? Um, we have strategies for doing that with learning management systems that are uh, some, they're painful but can be done. We don't currently have that with learning management systems. Um, right now, to the, our knowledge, and if anyone knows different, we'd love to find out, there are no products that make it easy to import and export. In fact, one of our runner-up vendors in, the, in our RFP said, well, what could we have done, or what can we do um, for the next RFP? And I said, write an importer for Lab Archive. So that we can move, if they make it easy to move our data, they're obviously going to be a better choice for us in the future. The other thing is, very few of them have any capability of exporting a subset or even or the whole thing or a subset of data for import into a different instance of the product. So if someone does move from one lab archives institution to another, the ability to easily migrate that data is all reliant on the vendor, and I don't like that. Um, and it means access to all kinds of data sharing tools are going to be problematic in the same way. So part of it is what institutions will choose to do with that open API and what can we get the vendors to do. Um, just as an example, we had, we had several users of the ECAT software, um, which is now a company called Research Space, which you may see if you ever do a ELN RFP. Um, we had several active users who had uh, more than a year's worth of data in ECAT. And their solution to migrating data was to export as PDFs and import that into Lab Archives. The nice thing is Lab Archives indexes PDFs just fine, so they maintain the searchability of their record, and it, had, it put them in an okay position in terms of keeping that, that complete record searchable. So, when you think about the archival formats that are available, and this is where we're turning to you as the experts on, on some of this archival, um, uh, on how, how we need to move forward on the archival nature of, or archiving ELNs, is um, right now we're looking at PDFs plus attached files. Uh, that in some ways that makes sense because for a long time the way that a researcher could um, demonstrate the legal aspects of their, of their electronic lab notebooks is by printing them out and signing them and maintaining a paper copy, but that's probably less than ideal. So some of the standard models for archival formats are um, something we need to look at with people who understand them better than us. The, um, we should say Jan and I are science, uh, came out of the bench sciences, so we maintain paper lab notebooks. So we're um, looking for your expertise and trying to help us figure out what, what would be a good way to archive this. Perhaps the most interesting thing that we're, we're seeing is some work being done by the University of Edinburgh on, um, it's actually a collaboration with the other, one of the other vendors that went through our RFP called Research Space on an integration between lab notebooks and their, their institutional repository. And we're hoping that they have some better solutions for us. And then trying to figure out what is an appropriate metadata standard for archiving electronic lab notebooks is something we need to think through. Um, starting with the standard things you would expect, Dublin Core, um, there's a, a European standard um, called SERIF that uh, is about maintaining the, the, the contextual information about the research who was involved, what publications were made out of that research, um, what facilities were involved, what instruments, but that, that doesn't get at the hard part, and that's that detailed information. And how much does an ELN have to maintain 
um, very specific metadata for a discipline and how much of it can be generalized to a, a, a large audience. So at this stage, um, we're interested in finding out how you're helping your, your people uh, archive their research data now and how would you envision using tools like ELN and what do we have what do we have to do to convince the vendor so I actually am having dinner with the vendor in a couple of months or a couple of weeks and I, my whole goal is to pitchfork him into <laughs> to moving forward with some of these things that we really need to protect our data for the long term they of course want to keep us in their product forever um, but we know that that's not if I've said this to him several times that the best way you can show us that you will that um, that you're a, a good collaborator is showing us that we can leave um, that you have a mechanism for us to get our data out in a format that's useful and that probably is a, that's the best sign to us that what you're trying to do will help us going forward so at this stage I'm hoping that you have comments or questions we, we can talk about the what we're doing with the ELN we can talk a bit more about the product if you're interested um, I don't know if the, our colleagues from Cal um, Caltech or Cornell know much about the ELN uh, um, but maybe they have any if they have any input that would be interesting for us as well I don't want to keep you longer but we're happy to answer questions or if you want to find out more about our lab notebook or other things, we're happy to talk throughout the rest of the conference. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.